Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Marfil. I graduated MDiv here in IAS this year. My, the title of my paper, this is a paper I submitted in one of my classes uh, before. The title of my paper is uh, The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as Salvific Appellations or Titles for Salvation, not Personal Names. Fundamental Beliefs number two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church states, there is one God, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. God is immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, above all, and ever-present. He is infinite and beyond human comprehension, yet known through His self-revelation. He is forever worthy of worship, adoration, and service by the whole creation. This statement of belief is clear enough to dispel any doubt that the Church upholds the doctrine of the Trinity in its biblical sense, yet it does not it does more than that. It assumes that the names of these three persons are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit without giving any indication as to their ontology or their being. This is a more explicit statement of the equality of the three persons than that held by the Roman Catholic Church and other Protestant churches that embrace the Nicene Creed, part of which states, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. And uh, I will highlight that phrase, eternally begotten of the Father. Uh, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial of one being with the Father. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. In the Nicene Creed, there is no explicit reference to the Holy Spirit as God, although it ascribes glory and worship to Him. As a matter of fact, there is an explicit manifestation in the belief that the Holy Spirit is simply a procession from the Father and the Son. In short, there is a subordination for the third member of the Godhead, which is the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, the Son was clearly accorded consubstantiality with the Father, implying that the two are ontologically as well as hypostatically the same. Ontologically meaning by being, hypostatically mean by essence. Uh, something not attributed to the Holy Spirit. So they do not, in the Nicene Creed, they do not attribute the ontological features of the Father and the Son and the hypostatical features to the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. From this brief comparison of the Trinitarian statements of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Nicene Creed, it is the former, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, that upholds a more complete understanding of the doctrine that leaves no room for speculation on subordination of any member of the Trinity. Nevertheless, the issue of subordination versus economy or function within the God that has still pervaded the Adventist Church. It is intriguing that some forms of Arianism still find their way in the Church in spite of the express statement of beliefs to the contrary. One such contention is that while the doctrine of the Trinity is correct in the sense that all three persons are God, the Son is lower than the Father as the Spirit is lower than the Son. A contributory factor in this ideology is the seemingly hierarchical structure, hierarchical structure uh, suggested by the appellations, by the titles Father and Son. And I was very sad to read uh, a Facebook exchange by one of our prominent conference pastors, he used to be a prominent leader, who's advocating a belief that the Holy Spirit is not a person. It's not God. I don't know, maybe you know this. Maybe you have read this in Facebook exchange also by one of our prominent uh, radio personality and one of our pastors. So, it's an issue. The problem lies... The problem lies on whether or not the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are ontological in nature or functional. Meaning, is the Father, is really the Father. By being, by virtue of, of His being, He is the Father. And by virtue of His being, Jesus is the Son. And by virtue of His being, the Holy Spirit is that, the Holy Spirit. If the roles are ontological, the implication is a completely different picture of the Godhead, which is the non-equality, seemingly, among the members. If, on the other hand, the roles are not absolute relationship, then there must be a different understanding of salvation, which is non-anthropocentric, meaning salvation 
as always pointed out, uh, if I may say, by Dr. Song here, Fias, it's not only, it's not limited to the first, to, to humanity, not anthropocentric. It has something to do with the entire government of God. The doctrine of the Trinity is now being besieged by Adventists and non-Adventists alike. There are those who profess a belief in the Trinity that deny the co-equality status of either the Son or the Holy Spirit. This study intends to bring together biblical and some theological insights regarding the co-equal nature of the members of the Godhead to their Trinitarian roles as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is therefore the purpose of this essay to build a case in favor of the functional roles of the Trinitarian appellations, the names, that they assume, and to dispute the position that they are ontological in nature. And uh, on the uh, benefit of time, I will not go on the part of the essay where I talk lengthly about the equality of the Son because I realize this is a forum on the Holy Spirit. So I will skip that, uh, that part. In the apophatic summation of Bellonic in 1984, apophatic meaning the negative um, argument for God. In the apophatic summation of Deborah Bellonic, he, she says, when all other concepts and names for God were negated, there emerged the personal God named Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So she is of the opinion that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a personal name. During the patristic period, there was a consensus in the West about the ontological significance of the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Such theological treatises abound during this period primarily in response to a myriad of anti-Trinitarian movements. For example, Athanasius, in his defense of the Trinitarian names against the Arian proposal of creator, savior, sanctifier uh, by, by Arius, wrote that, this is Athanasius, wrote that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit appellations, or the names, referred to God's own essence and being, ontologi ontologically and uh, hypostatically. It is worth noting here that this church father, remember the uh, Athanasians against the world when everyone else in the Catholic, well, in the universal Catholic church at the time was gearing towards uh, Arianism, here was the bishop, Athanasius, who was alone in his stand of uh, the Trinity. And this is what one of his major arguments, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they are ontological and hypostatically uh, referring to the, to, to the Godhead uh, to fight Arianism. It is worth noting that this church father's pronouncement of, this, of the hypostatic and ontological nature of the names attributed to God is a polemical reaction against those who believe that Jesus Christ is not equal with God. In other words, Athanasius takes a position that solidly counters only the alternative theology, which is that they are not equal. In the same vein, from the patristic fathers, uh, from the patristic literature, Gregory of Nyssa labored to fend off the eunomians by writing lengthy discussion on the names and attributes of the members of the Godhead. The name Father, according to Gregory, implies an existence of a child from all eternity. A second person who is co-ruling, co-equal, and co-eternal with God, it connotes that the initiator, of a, uh, the initiator of a generation, the inaugurator of all, the one who begets life rather than conceiving it and bringing it to fruition in birth. The important thing here is he's maintaining that there is a child from all eternity. This child seems also to be understood by Gregory as ontological. Before anyone can jump to conclusions, however, one must keep in mind that he is building, Gregory, a case, again, against uh, the patriarchal primacy in naming God. Because at that time, there were many other church leaders who were trying to give names, but he was saying, no, we have to stick with what we have. Modern-day scholars who support the ontological nature of the name of God are plenty also. For them, the name Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a personal name for God, which is revealed by none other than Jesus Christ himself in the baptismal formula in Matthew 28, 19. However, such attributions are not considered to simply be an accommodative, but are taken as evidence for the ontological relationship within the Godhead and their hypostasis. 
For example, Norman Gully, 2011, emphasizes that God is a relational God. This is how the Father, Son, and Spirit have existed together forever. This is what they have always experienced. This is what they will always experience. So in effect, he's saying that God, the Father, will always be a Father to Jesus, the Son, who will always be the Son. Well, well if, even if we don't talk about post-crucifixion or post-incarnation, because as we know, the, Jesus Christ will always bear uh, the wounds that he has suffered for us. And in that sense, he is forever kind of like the Son. But even before the incarnation, it seems, Norman Galli seems to suggest that the Son is the Son, even before there was a need to send the Son, even before there was a problem of sin in that effect. And the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit, even before all of this. Such eternal relationship entails eternal subordination as Gali maintained that in heaven the Father glorifies the Son and the Spirit, suggesting an eternal glorifier, glorified relationship among the three. So there's a glorifier, there's a glorified, and then there's another glorifier, there's another glorified. So there's, there seems to be a hierarchical, hierarchical relationship as I understand Norman Gali's work. Through an interpretation of John 5.16, Glenn Crider, 2011, supports this subordination by noting that the eternal son had been watching the father work prior to the incarnation. So prior to the incarnation, the son is already the son and he is already emulating the father. For Crider, the ministry of Jesus Christ as the incarnate son of God is an evidence that he has forever been um, copying God the father. The implication, of course, is that one being emulated is greater than the one emulating. Thus, the Father and the Son relationship is, hier is hierarchical in this nature. Such hierarchy also entails the concept of generation and procession for the Son and the Holy Spirit, respectively. Bellonic, again, uh, in another article, she wrote, before time within the mystery of the Holy Trinity, God generated another person as human fathers generate seed. This is a very bold proposal. The implication is that the son is a generated person. She further clarifies her position. The persons are marked, but not determined by these relations. The divine terms, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, primarily name the persons and secondarily describe the relationships among them. So for her, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the actual name of the persons in the Godhead. The importance of the relational aspects of the divine appellations is acknowledged, but the primacy is still given to them being personal, eternal names with all the inherent ontological characteristics that, the, that each name carries within it. Divine appellations as ontological. Amidst the overwhelming position of ontology, yeah. Amidst the overwhelming position of ontology, the counter proposition is that the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit does not necessarily point to God's ontology nor hypothesis, but rather to the roles each member of the Godhead assumed for the sake of accomplishing the plan of salvation. This is the position of this essay. One may also find some theologians who deny the ontological properties of the name of God in the patristic literature. For instance, another Gregory by the name uh, Gregory of Nazianzen surmises that the Father is not a name either of an essence or an action, but it is the name of the relation in which the Father stands to the Son and the Son to the Father. So there is a position that is uh, similar to uh, the current position. In general terms, the Eastern Orthodox Church upholds the position that the personhood of the Trinity precedes relationship within and each member of the Godhead, and they have the characteristic of Father and a source. So, theologically speaking, it seems, at least in very brief and incomplete survey, it seems to me that there are more theologians who are suggesting, at least in literature, that the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are ontological attributes of God, that the Father is a Father as in human relationship, according to uh, Bellonic as well. But there are also those who are on the other side of the pond and claiming that no, these are relational or economic 
names, economic meaning functional in that sense. Uh, let me try and give a biblical uh, exploration, considerations of this issue. The confusion regarding the nature of God can be traced to different can be traced to different understanding and interpretations of passages in the Bible that talks about God. The whole of Scripture is replete with references to the attributes of God and His divine nature and interactions with man. It is not within the ambit of this essay to make an exhaustive list of such attributes or even names of God or the Holy Spirit. This has been done in previous papers uh, in this forum. For purposes of this paper, four of the most relevant passages are considered and explained, and for purposes of this presentation, I will only present two, I think. John 5, 22 to 23. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the, God, the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. In this verse, the Father divests, that's the word, divests, the authority to judge to the Son, so that the Son will receive the same honor as that of the fathers. One might ask, when did the divestment or conferral occur? This event can be traced back to the so-called Council of the Godhead, alluded to in Isaiah 42 verse 1. This verse is one of the most explicit references of plurality within the Godhead. And this is one of our biblical basis for our fundamental belief statement number two. Uh, it reads, here is my servant, which is the first person. Uh, here is my first person, servant, second person, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit, third person, on him, and he will bring justice to the nation. This verse shows that before incarnation, the second person of the Godhead has already been chosen by the first person to bring justice to the nations. Yet, this is made possible because the third person has been put on him. Gali observes that the New Testament comments, comments that this passage from Isaiah was fulfilled in the healing ministry of Jesus, who was sent by the Father and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, the question is, does John 5, 22-23 teach that Jesus, being God the Son, only derive his authority to judge from God the Father. If this is so, then that means he is really somewhat subordinate to the Father. Well, my answer is no. This judgment work is a work that only a divine being can do. And so the fact that the fact that the Son can judge implies that within Him is divinity equal to that of the Father. Uh, my own computer is telling me to watch the time. Okay. John 5, 22 to 23 does not at all teach subordination, but rather equality. The word commit used in the passage is the translation of the Greek word didomi. This word could mean several other things in both literal and figurative senses. One such possible translation of this word is yield in a very simple word study. The word commit used in the passage is the translation of the word didomi. This word uh, could mean yield. Understood this way, yield, English, it implies that the one yielding has equal rights or authority to the one benefiting. For one cannot yield that which one does not hold. I cannot yield my time to you if I don't, in the first place, have no right to be here. So in effect, when Jesus Christ was yielding to the Father, he was yielding that which he already has. For one, can it, uh, it presents a harmonious relationship between the Father and the Son and affirms that both the Father and the Son in this scene are equally humbling themselves to each other. Now there is uh, a discussion in, in the original paper of the uh, the commencements of Christ's sonship, the firstborn, but I would like to jump to this. 
Calvin, in arguing for the timelessness of God and for equivocity, considered scriptural passages that seemingly speak of univocal elements such as relationship as simply accommodative language of the scriptures. This is in Canale. What does this mean? Essentially, what Calvin and Canale is saying that in scriptures, there are accommodative language, and I'm sure most of you know what this means, but I will try to make it I, as I understand it. It means that the Bible uses linguistic terms for human beings to understand the attribute of God. And God is accommodating the limitation of man. And so, instead of saying that, hey, I am, and then give, uh, 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 let's say, X, this is my being, and we don't know what X means, but we know what father means, we, we know, we experience how to have a father or how to have a son, and so the Bible accommodates our linguistic limitations. This is what Calvin and Canale is saying. The verse shows that before incarnation, sorry, Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 describes how God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. It is not therefore very strange if God would accommodate the human mind's capacity by using imagery, metaphors, which he always has, symbolism, and yes, even names. To reveal himself and his will. This does not make him ontologically limited to these linguistic accommodations. When God says, I will open my eyes, or I will open my ear in Isaiah 59, to those who pray, it does not mean that God necessarily has an ear. Maybe he has, but he is not limited to his metaphor. God is not limited to his symbols. And God is not limited to the names revealed to accommodate our understanding. The baptismal appellation do not define God's ineffable essence, neither do they describe an attribute or action of God toward humanity. This is the position. So this is not uh, the essence of God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are functional roles, but they are not the essence of the Godhead pre-incarnation. That's the second person's confirmant. Let me skip. Names and roles now. Let me proceed to the last part of this presentation of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus left his disciples, he promised them that he will leave the paracletos to them in a sentential structure that is almost like a parallelism, a chiasm, if you may. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And then it is the comforter who would come anyway. So in a sentential structure, if you put it in a microstructure level, it seems like uh, as a uh, pastor earlier uh, in the morning was talking about, it's, a, it's an equal, uh, it's an equa equational sentence in that sense. In, in tracing the appearances of the Spirit in the Bible, we can find that He is called differently depending on His role. In the creation is the Spirit of God, when God is deeply involved with the affairs of Israel, the Spirit is called the Spirit of Jehovah. In the conception, He was called as the Holy, Holy Ghost. He is the Spirit of Jesus when guiding missionaries. He is the Spirit of Christ that indwells with the believers. And He is the Spirit of Jesus that supplies the wants of His people. The climax of the Spirit's role, at least uh, in my understanding, in terms of human salvation, is when he, the Holy Spirit, becomes the seven spirits of God in Revelation. Thus, the Holy Spirit takes on different roles according to what is needed to be done. He's very flexible as the Son was flexible. In much the same way as the Son's response to the call of sacrifice mentioned in Isaiah, it gives us a glimpse of how the Spirit is not simply a stagnant force or a procession. Rather, He is, the Holy Spirit, is an active agent in the plan of redemption taking on different functions to teach, to comfort, to help, and to advocate, etc., etc. That is why in the New Testament, according to uh, Gali, some roles of the Spirit in Christ are seemingly interchangeable. Let me proceed to my conclusion.
The theological discussion in presented the underlying intention that some early church fathers had when defending the Father, Son, Holy Spirit formula as fixed and from everlasting. Their general agenda was to battle oppositions of the Trinitarian theology that were pushed upon the church by the Arians during their time. Even the modern scholar's stance of ontological nature of such appellation are instigated by a desire to repudiate alternative theologies related to Trinity, Divinity, or the Godhead. In the case of Belonic, the issue is against the reason why she's very strong on the ontological nature of the names is because she was reacting against the feminist theology that rejects Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In feminist churches, when they baptize, they don't say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They say in the name of the sustainer, etc., etc. Because Father is, as you know, it's not genderly, politically, genderly, gender correct or gender sensitive language, and also the Son. And so Belonik was writing in 1984 against this, as the Church Fathers was writing against the Aryans. And so when they are positioning themselves ontologically and using the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as sort of like a frontier, they are doing that in an apologetic manner. In the final analysis, the, the, subordination, the subordinationist belief that Christ and the Holy Spirit's authority and ontology are inferior to the Father is a rehash of Lucifer's confabulation that Jesus is not God overall and that he is not in fact ascend to his very throne. It is therefore the conclusion of this study that the appellations Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not ontological appellations, but rather only economic or functional that each takes for the salvation of human beings and finally in the words of Pinnock in Mueller how ironical for a classical theism to claim that God is unlimited and deny that he is able to do the very things the Bible says that he can do and does do changing is something God can do and more wonderfully it is something God wills to, the, to do for the sake of our salvation what basically I am stating is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were functions that the members of the Godhead, the first, the second, the third person, not in that order, obviously, not in a hierarchical order, uh, took the names, the appellation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in order to function their specific roles in the plan of salvation. Thank you very much. If there are questions, you can email Pastor Ioannis. No, 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 no. Okay, um, we'll go with Dr. Alan. Wait, why me? Uh, I think your discussion of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as, as names for the uh, Godhead is, is a helpful one. Uh, and it affirms the, the real equality of uh, uh, the three. Um, the, the language does imply some sorts of hierarchy, but I think that uh, you've explained that in a way that is really very helpful. Thank you.